Hi, this is Paul, and I've been wanting to see the Joker movie for a little bit, and I got a chance to see it last night. And the Joker movie, I think, is a masterpiece at destroying the idols of our age. It is a violent movie. It is rated R, and for a reason. It is definitely not appropriate for children, but I, I was very impressed by the movie. And one of the things that really interested me in this was that sort of like Tolkien's I'm gonna to want to see the movie again but sort of like Tolkien's world formal religious was religion was conspicuously absent in the movie which was very interesting now I put a comment on Jonathan's video when he came out with his video a couple of days ago he, he said right away that there were spoilers in the video so I didn't watch it I didn't watch it until this morning because I didn't want to have any of the spoils but I thought Jonathan had an excellent video, and this is a this is a great video for for Jonathan's gifts. And he noted that the, the fury around the movie is because it deconstructs our favorite cultural narratives. And I would go further to say that it gores all the competing sacred cows of our age, leaving us, especially our our secular conversations, leaving us without a religion at hand. All of the religions that we are that we are grasping at to try to save us from ourselves are failing and and we're falling into this aching gaping nihilism and the joker is at the bottom of it waiting for us the joker is is probably one of the more convincing um, satanic figures for our present cultural moment now, the director of this film was Todd Phillips, and Todd Phillips is known for a variety of comedy movies that aren't known to be especially deep. The Road Trip movies, Old School, Starsky and Hutch, the Hangover Trilogy, and Due Date. And now he got a, quite a bit of attention when he said, Todd Phillips says, woke culture is killing comedy movies. And so he's switched from a comedy movie to a horror movie. And I think instead of just Jonathan Pajon notes that there was a there's a movie out called It where there's a cat clown killing children. This movie is far more chilling because it's far closer to home. And when I saw the movie, I thought this guy has New York City from the 70s nailed because I grew up in Patterson, New Jersey, just outside of New York City and I'm watching this movie and it's like I'm back in Patterson and New York in the 1970s. Now he was born in 1970. I was born in 63. So he's about seven years, he's about seven years younger than I am, but he was born in Brooklyn. And yeah, yeah, he, he had it nailed. New York City before Friends and Sex in the City and Seinfeld was a grimy, dirty place where there were regular garbage strikes that shows up in this movie. A. Beam was the mayor and Ed Koch eventually, and that's all before the the Rudy Giuliani days. And the you know the, the city was a mess. Uh, uh, Times Square was peep shows and prostitutes and I mean it's it's just quintessential Gotham, and the movie nails that. Um, even even caught this out of the. You know, I was a news junkie as a kid. I would listen to 1010 10 Wins News 24-7. You know, you give us 20 minutes, we'll give you the world, Wins News would say, every 20 minutes. And I'd listen again and again and again. I'd listen to the news. There was even at, at one point in our school a, a little test competition on current events. And, and I won the competition just because I listened to the news all the time when I was when I was in high school. 1984, Bernie Getz shoots four young black men trying to mug him on a subway uh, the movie warriors in a sense captures some of this some of this gotham new york and and the movie the movie just really nails it and and this was this was of course uh where and when i grew up i grew up in patterson which is over the river about about 15 miles away from manhattan and we'd go there with with day camp kids and here i'm i'm a day camp counselor i'm going with the kids in my class and we're probably going to statue of liberty or some other place in new york that's that's what we that's what we would do 
Patterson is, again, just outside of New York City, and it was an old mill town, and, and these pictures, my father used to enjoy taking pictures, and so I have his I have his pictures. It was just this grimy, seedy place. When I went to New York City, when I revisited it in 2006, I was shocked at how clean and white the city was as compared to the city that I had known in the 70s. And, and when you go today, it's sort of this, sort of this, uh, this playground for um, for wealthy people, but but it was by no means that way. And, and Patterson continues. Patterson has not been rejuvenated. There's no friends in the. There's no Seinfeld or Sex in the City or Friends from Patterson, New Jersey. It remains the the rundown, grimy town that it was where where I grew up. But in the 1960s, there was so much optimism. They put up the Christopher Columbus projects and the, you know, all these high-rise housing developments. This was the land of urban renewal, where they would bulldoze the slums and put up these new modern places. But these new modern apartments descended into the kind of apartments that you'd see in the Joker movie. And the 1960s optimism, when my father's church was built, you know, Northside Chapel and. You know, everyone would be clean cut and sit in rows. And there's my father in his black suit and his clerical collar. That's 1960s Stan. 60s gave way to the 70s and 70s reality. Heroin went through Patterson. And next to the church, we have the Northside Addicts Re Rehabilitation Center. Here's Corky sitting outside it. Corky would go through, and you know, everybody had two, three names. Uh, Corky would go through the um, Addicts Rehabilitation Center, and he was also into photography, and so he and my father, and sometimes I would join them in 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 enlarging and developing black and white film. And, and Corky was a Corky was a great guy, but he lived through the the heroin epidemic in the in the seventies. That was before what we call the opi opioid epidemic. Then it was that's that's what life was like in Patterson. And so I was, I, that's where I grew up in terms of where I lived and where I went to church. I went to school in the Dutch Reformed um, Eastern Christian school system. But so in the summers, I worked as a day camp counselor. And here, here Frankie and I are sitting right next to the day camp bus. That was, that was very much the world. And so when I, this movie starts showing scenes from New York and cars from the 70s, those were the cars I learned to drive on. That was the, that was the city I knew growing up. The movie is vicious. The death of our idols, it just rips them apart. The social safety net, you know, the guy's already on seven psych drugs and wants more and and his his counselor won't won't give him any and the counselor never listens to him and, and the healthcare system is getting cut. And and there's a there's a there's a racial undercurrent in the movie and and right now people are looking for clean racial narratives where they can just have you know all of these nice clean narratives about one group against another group and white hats and dark hats and victims and oppressors and this movie just completely destroys all opportunity and capacity for those narratives uh, the economic narratives are unclear in fact all of the easy facile narratives that we grab onto that we imagine if we do this if we do that if only we could get people to do this or only we could get people to do that then the world would be saved they're all just destroyed by this movie and 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 the uh arthur jonathan did a nice job on that arthur who would become joker is a quintessential bucko in so many ways he lives with his mom in this crappy apartment and he's holding down a crappy job with you know playing a clown with white face and you know that you know these things are, I mean, there's, again, there's a racial undertone to this movie, but it doesn't allow you to settle into any easy narratives. It would be easy if he were a racist, but he doesn't seem to be a, a racist at all. He has genuine interest in the, in the single mom who lives down the hall and, and, and seems to, seems to have no ill will against her, even when he's, even when he's terribly dangerous. There's no good relationship with a woman for this man in this movie. And his relationship with his mother reminded me of Mindhunters, uh, that excellent Netflix series that goes into the, 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 the psychology behind the making of serial killers and, and how moms fit into the, the patterns that they discovered, especially in season number one is these unrealistic aspirations for fame and glory, but he's invisible in the world. 
and and the elites are both patronizing and condescending all at once there's they're a caretaker class but they're skimming the cream off the top of society express expressing both concern and disgust at the same time for the underlings and those so there's a social rage coming up from the oppressors but hurt people hurt people and the joker perfectly epitomizes that well you're not going to find any innocent victims here you're not going to find anyone who is guiltless you're not going to the movie is not going to allow you to imagine that all the oppression and brutality of 1970s modernity will will yield a whole class of of innocent altruistic victims who can be put at the top of the hierarchy and be allowed to rule it's not it's not going to let any of this happen there's social rage but the rage only yields chaos not justice and and then the question is who will be their king and their king will be a clown and and you have echoes of Mitt Romney's 47% takers and Hillary Clinton's basket of deplorables. And, and the movie goes through all of this very, very well. And then, of course, at the end, the center does not hold. I want to minimize the amount of spoiling that I do, but who will be the king in white face ruling over the land of chaos? And, well, what will he be? A while ago, when this when this conversation came out between Peter Thiel and Eric Weinstein, the beginning of his Portal series, I thought that was quite a conversation that those two had, and and this portion of it especially got my attention. So there is something that's very weird and punitive about the desire for redistribution. I mean, there's a, almost a desire to tag the wealthy that has nothing to do with taking care of the unfortunate. And, and of course, this is something that Jordan Peterson, following George Orwell, has, has really brought out nicely. movie gets this and the movie drips with this and arthur fleck is the is the poster child for this he's not black he's not hispanic he's not puerto rican i mean black hispanic puerto rican those were pretty important groups in in patterson and in new york city in the 70s he's white but he's 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 white on the margins and he's he's not all there and and you know there's issues with his mom and all of this and and boy the speech that he gives at the cli at near the climax of the movie uh, you're going to want to recognize it because again this movie is a masterpiece this movie is 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 you know a terrifying prophecy mm. it's always heard as an insult and uh and i'm not sure they're wrong to to feel that well and i feel that a lot of the talk about redistribution is actually uh families of high 8 through 11 figures <laughs> when he said that i had to sit there and think how much money is eight through 11 figures? Because in my class, you know, if someone's making six figures, well, they're doing really well. Eight to 11, that's rich. Um, trying to figure out how to target families of six figure through low eight figure wealth uh, as the targets of the redistribution, that the very wealthy will be able to shelter assets and protect themselves, or maybe even, uh, you know, switch, switch nations. Whereas people who are dentists and orthodontists uh, and accountants are going to be the ones viewed as the rich who are going to be incapable of getting themselves out of the way. So I think that partially what, what good faith conversation mm -hmm. between left and right opens up is, is that we have a shared interest in uncovering all of the schemes of the people who enjoy pushing around pieces of paper and giving speeches in order to uh, engineer society for their own reasons. Yeah, so now, now there's a populism 
in Eric's comment here that again he's dividing the world between good people and bad people that well the, the the you know there's even sort of an anti-elitism in Eric's comment there that that here the the bad people are the 8 to 11 figure wealthy people who are pushing around papers and they're the masters of the universe and maybe they're like Thomas Wayne and they well they have a certain amount of both disdain and well you know compassion for these underlings here but we we captains of the world we know better and we're going to push this around and then there's the good people down below you know eight figures and below <laughs> Woo um eight figures and below and all the way down and they're the good people and and so you know eric maintains the 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 modernist the modernist notion of of the you know of the goodness of of regular people and why can't left and right have a have a you know a conversation together and come to a reasonable come to a reasonable conclusion about these things the joker movie won't won't deal with any of that there's no there's no reasonable people in that movie everybody thinks they're reasonable in fact everybody thinks they're reasonable even the main figure of the film thinks he's reasonable but what you see in this film is that nobody is reasonable nobody is pure of course now there's going to be a boy in this movie that i don't want to go into because i don't want to go into spoilers but there's a lot going on here but but in a sense having seen the movie and listening to eric here eric looks populist modern and and once you see the movie a skepticism about well can we real are we really that rational is it is it is it really only those people who are polluted up there but eight figures and below might they be polluted as well and hmm. one way i would i would uh restate what you just said sure would be that uh um you know, redistribution from the powerful to the powerless, from the rich to the poor is like from the powerful to the powerless. And so you're using power to go after those with power. And that's almost oxymoronic. It's, it's almost, almost self-contradictory. And listen, listen to him carefully here, because he's about to say something very interesting. So like from the powerful to the powerless. And so you're using power to go after those with power. And that's almost oxymoronic. It's almost self-contradictory. And so um, there may be some way to do that. I think um, most of the time you end up with, um, with some fake redistribution, some sort of <coughs> complicated shell game of... He's, he's, he's singing the Joker's song right here. One sort or some fake redistribution, some sort of <coughs> complicated shell game of one sort or another. Right. And... Uh, you know the the, the very and I know the, the causation of the stuff is much much trickier, but if we if we look at societies that are you know somehow further to the left on on some scale, right. um, the inequality you have to go really far to the left before and maybe just destroy the whole society before you really start solving you know the inequality program. See, where the Joker goes is well, we're not going to go to the left or to the right in order to destroy the whole society. The whole society just needs to be destroyed problem. California, when I first moved here as a kid in 1977, uh, would, would have been sort of a centrist state in the U.S. politically and was broadly middle class. Today, California is the second most democratic state. It's a D plus 30 state. It's uh, super unequal. And, uh, and at least on a correlated basis, not causation, but at least on a correlated basis, um, the further to the left it's gone, the more unequal it's become. And, and what you hear in there from the narrative from he moved to California in the 70s. And since the 70s, California was California was the American dream. It was it was quite a bit more equal. It was quite a bit more centrist. And now California has both gotten way more woke, way more divided. The, the, the haves and the have nots. California has gotten like Gotham. And and so the movie is sort of set in the 70s. But we're sitting at the movie at the end of the of the 20 teens and we're feeling the fraying come apart and and in fact if if that's what gotham looked like in the 70s but it feels like now we've gone from gotham city being this to all of california being this and the the skepticism and the anxiety and the worry are just below the surface and there is something pretty weird about that there is you know something that 
sort of fits in here is that in part I've learned from you, um, and you can tell me whether you recognize in this formulation or not, is start with any appealing social idea. That's step one. Step two, ask what is the absolute minimal level of violence and coercion that would be necessary to accomplish that idea? Okay, well, what's that an acknowledgement of? That if you've got a social idea and you want it to move forward, you're going to need a level of coercion and violence, either, either metaphorical violence or, or actual violence to get it done. That's, that's what states do. States have a monopoly on violence in order to achieve certain goals, to develop a hierarchy, to get individuals in line, to get them to do something. But if you have a goal, let's say like, well, maybe saving the world from environmental devastation or saving the world from nuclear catastrophe or saving the world from the, ra the rage of the poor below rising up and, and tearing down society, the barbarians at the gates. What, what level of society do you need to impose on the masses in order to achieve that goal? Next is start with any appealing social idea. That's step Appealing to who, but go on. One. Step two, ask what is the absolute minimal level of violence and coercion that would be necessary to accomplish mm -hmm. that idea? Now add that to the original idea. Mm -hmm. Do you still find your original idea attractive? Mm -hmm. And that this flips many of these mm -hmm. um, propositions into territory where I suddenly realize that something that people see as being very attractive actually can only be accomplished with so much misery, right. even if it's done maximally efficiently, that it's no longer a good idea. Now, what he says there is super brilliant and super real and very below the surface. And I think that is exactly what many who, well, let's face it, if you're watching this video, you're probably part of the elite of the world. Well, what do you mean by that? I mean, you, you might not even be making four or five figures, never mind six to eight. But you're watching videos, you're engaging in the thoughts and the commentary of the of the leadership of the world. You vote in a in a major developed country, and I, I can look at the demographics of my videos. Most of the people who watch my videos are from the United States, Canada, the UK, and Australia, and after that it tails off into the rest of the world. So if you are a resident of the United States, or Canada, or the UK, or Australia, and you're listening to my video, you're part of the elite in many ways and and you have ideas and anxieties about how the world can be saved from what threatens it and what the world needs and the the main obstacle for all of that happening is what other people are going to do and then the question is what means are will be necessary to get other people to do what you think they should do in order for the world to straighten up and be saved now put those two things on two sides how much coercion? We're going to get to the question of global warming, and here's one of the issues with global warming. Let's say the United States and Europe flatten out and become net zero in terms of carbon. Will that solve anything? Well, what about China? What about India? What about Africa? What about other parts of the developed world, or the, the developing world? I mean, even if these these the most advanced the most educated the most successful places in the world get to net zero in terms of carbon how are you going to make china and asia and africa do it and what are you going to say to those countries that say we want to develop cheap too what are you going to say to them well how willing are you to coerce them to get them to do what you want them to do See, this isn't just within national borders. This is transnational. And I think that this influence, I mean, this has been very influential in my thinking. Um, and what I've... Yeah, look, the, 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 the visceral problem with communism is not, is not... Coercion, you mentioned? Well, here are some of our ways that we've done it in the 20th century. It's ridiculous influence. I mean, this has been very influential in my thinking. Um, and what I've... Yeah, look, the, 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 the visceral problem with communism is not is not its redistributive tendencies. It's the extreme violence it's that you have to kill tons of people. You know, there's always, there's always a, uh, one of the professors I studied under at Stanford, Rene Girard, was a sort of great 
philosophical, sociological, anthropological. Who? Who did you study under? Thinker. You know, there's always there's always a uh, one of the professors I studied under at Stanford, Rene Girard, was this great philosophical, sociological, anthropological thinker, and uh, you know he had this observation that he thought communism among Western intellectuals became unfashionable. Uh, you could date it to the year 1953, the year Stalin died. And the reason was they were they were not communist in spite of the millions of people being killed. They were communist because of the millions of people that were being killed. As long as you were willing to kill millions of people, that was a tell, a sign that you were, you were building the utopia, you were building a great new society. And when you stopped, you know, it, well, it was just going to be like the lethargy of the Brezhnev era or something like that. What is this? This is no pain, no gain on a massive level. Now, I was listening to, I've been listening to Hardcore History, the Hardcore History podcast, and I'm waiting for the next version to come out. I feel like some of you guys, when I miss a day or two of posting, and you're like, where's the next video? I'm waiting for the next Hardcore fit History. He was making a comment about the fact that when the Assyrians, when the Assyrians did violence against another culture, well, they didn't attempt to hide it. You know, they didn't, like the Germans did, kind of put it far away from its population to see in some of these death camps. The Assyrians just, they made, they put, they plastered it on their walls. And they, they, they just had it out there in front. They, the Assyrians wanted everybody to know what it was. Now, one of the things that Rene Girard gets into is his thesis, which this was, I thought, the video I was going to make today, but then I saw the movie last night and decided to go forward with this video. But his thesis is that religion is act was actually what we developed to address violence, okay? A pervasive violence that was always uh, that was always threatening to just to destroy society and destroy each other and and Rene Girard pushes it back so far to say you know basically with with human beings because when we come out of the womb we're so weak and so weak for so long that in fact for humanity to survive we had to develop religion for human people to actually have time to grow up and that if humanity didn't have religion it never would have gone anywhere as a species because we simply would have destroyed ourselves but now here we are in the 21st century at the brink of destroying ourselves and we all look around at this time and date and we think oh wow this is a new thing we're at the threat of destroying ourselves but actually if you go back through history Humanity has always felt itself at the brink of destroying itself, and the answer to the, the question of destroying itself was religion. Now, now, part of René Girard's observation with respect to communism there is brilliant, and it should be overwhelmingly disturbing for a romanticist modernist era that likes to imagine that human beings are somehow good and nice at heart, and in fact our violence and our evil is only an aberration from our normal state. What René Girard and what the Joker, and in fact what what we are beginning to suspect underneath the surface surface is that this programming that Eric's brothers that Eric's brother Brett keeps talking about that we have to simply transcend that uh, we might not be able to do it. In fact, even all this talk of transcending it might itself simply be a trick by the wealthy and the powerful to the hermeneutic of suspicion applied by the wealthy and the powerful to get what they want at the expense of the masses. That's what's beneath the surface. And that's what Joker, as a revelation, as a disclosure, as an apocalypse, reveals to us that, oh, you're hoping that the victims of our society can rise up and be the new benevolent kings? Hurt people hurt people. That's a truism, too. The real mystery may not be, where does the evil come from? The real mystery might be, where does the kindness come from? Where does the self-restraint come from? Where does the order come from? Where do we get the source to stop our avarice, not to indulge it? And, and Rene Girard sees this and knows this. And so, of course, Girard has influenced Thiel now, and, and, and quite deeply, obviously. But, but let's go back and hear what he says again, because his, his observation here that communism lost its oomph when the blood stopped. The Aztecs would have known this. Societies, Sun Tzu, 
Isn't it Sun Tzu that says you already know when, when, a, when a nation will lose war depending on what's happening in the temple? The book of Ezekiel knows this. What happens in the temple bleeds out into the rest of society. There must be ritual. There must be sacrifice in order for society to live, in order for violence to be abated, in order for us to stop. You were, as you were people being killed, isn't what, uh, you could date it to the year 1950, a logical thinker. And, uh, you know, he had this observation that he, sociologists I studied under at Stanford, Rene Girard was a sort of great philosophical, sociological, anthropological thinker. And, uh, you know, he had this observation that he thought communism among Western intellectuals became unfashionable. Uh, you could date it to the year 1953, the year Stalin died. And the reason was they were, they were not communist in spite of the millions of people being killed. They were communist because of the millions of people that were being killed. The blood of their victims justified the rightness of their thought. Now, we don't like to think that, but if you read Timothy Snyder about what's below Nazism, if, if you understand Stalin having to break a few eggs, you can understand, well, this is something we don't want to think about ourselves. We don't want to think that. That's what human beings are. And in fact, all of the all of the revisionist justification when you ask people today, I mean, no one would no one would dare flow through American streets with swastikas. Well, a very few do with swastikas on banners, but but many would say, well, we need to we need to try communism again. Well, that was just an aberration that they killed so many people. We need to try atheism again. That was an aberration. And what Rene Girard says, which is so deeply unsettling, is. What if that isn't case? What if, what if in fact, the bloodletting of, of the Soviet Union and, and Maoist China and, 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 and Pol Pot's Cambodia, what if that wasn't a bug, but a feature? And in fact, as, well, what did Eric Weinstein just in a minute say? What level of violence is tolerable for a group of people in order to accomplish something? Well, does that sound so strange? Because when we look at an individual level, we ask, what level of sacrifice is required of an individual to accomplish something? My mama scrubbed floors so that I could go to college. I worked night and day so that I could have enough tuition to pay. When I started my, my small business, I worked 18 hours a week. We all understand that sacrifice is necessary, and this is deeply built into us. And now, when we scale up to the societal, the society, and we think, oh, sacrifice is, is not required in order for us to achieve something? Ah, oh, no, I don't think we believe that. I think we fully understand sacrifice is required. So if sacrifice is required, how, in fact, will it be managed? And that's exactly where Rene Girard points us towards religion, that religion is the means by which violence is dealt with in human society so we don't kill ourselves. As long as you were willing to kill millions of people, that was a tell, a sign that you were, you were building the utopia, you were building a great new society. And when you stopped, you know, it was just going to be like the lethargy of the Brezhnev era or something like that. And that, that was not inspiring. I mean, people shifted from Stalin to Mao or Castro, or, but, uh, but the, um, the violence was charismatic. I think very charismatic. And then, uh, but then also, you know, it's very, if you think about it, it's very undesirable. That's a chilling thought. What if this is true of us? Well, would we find evidence for such a claim? Uh, human history? <laughs> this seems deeply true of us. And, and this is the problem. What if, what if the problem isn't them? What if the problem is me? When well, Rene Girard will go and say, well, this is the, well, this is the first confession in an AA mo in an AA meeting, you know, what do you have to see? That no, it's it's not my wife who's the problem. It's not my kids who are the problem. It's not the parents who are the problem. It's not the Jews or the black man or the white man or the or the or the the Mexican slipping above the border. The problem is me, and the problem is us. Well, well, well. Suddenly, all of the little all of the little projects, all the little political projects that we wish to employ to to bring about utopia upon the word world, they suddenly don't look so good. How much blood will have to be shared 
for, uh, for this utopia to come. And whose blood? Usually, it's the blood of my enemies. I think that there, it's so fascinating that we actually finally get to something like this. I think that that is a correct description of part of the communist movement, but not all of the communist movement. There were a lot of people, I think, in that just my own family um, was certainly involved in far left politics, and some of it probably dipped into communism. What my sense of it was is that there was a period in the 30s where people realized that there had to be coordinated social action and that there were people who were too vulnerable, and that that somehow got wrapped up in all of the things that Stalin was talking about that sounded positive if you didn't know the reality. Mm -hmm. So for example, Paul Robeson, Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. you know, a hero of the, of the, of the left, you know, was extolling Stalin's virtues openly. My guess is, is that he didn't fully understand what had happened, that he had gotten involved Mm -hmm. in an earlier era. And that as things became known and progressed, there was a, point at which many people suddenly opened their eyes and said, I've been making Mm -hmm. excuses for the Soviet Union because at least it had the hope. I mean, you know, there were American blacks, for example, who moved to Moscow um, because of the the, the hope that it was going to be a racially more equal society. Uh, My own family, you know, I would say was talking about, um, you know, interracial marriage and homosexual open uh, the support of homosexuality, female access to birth control, those things were associated with the Communist Party. And a lot of those ideas are now commonplace, but we forget that, you know, once upon a time, only the communists were willing to dance with these things. Yes, I, look, I, what I, I don't want to make this too ad hominem, but I want to say that people like... Oh, this isn't ad hominem at all. Your family yeah. were likely very intelligent people, but were somehow still always the useful idiots. And uh, and there was no, no country where the communists actually came to power, where people like those in your family actually got to make the decisions. Now, now again, here we have the good people and the bad people. That Well, the bad people got in power. Well, well, how is it? How are we so unlucky that so often the bad people come into power? Oh, well, it's it's obvious that, well, power corrupts the people, and so anybody with power will be bad. Therefore, we need to take those people down, what, and give somebody else power to have the power corrupt them? I mean, well, you begin to you begin to unpack these narratives, and you begin to say, well, 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 what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Because, well, maybe Eric Weinstein's family is, you know, they're all good people because the good people are me and my friends and those around us. And the bad people, they're the ones out there. What, the ones on the other side of the border wall? The ones on the other side of the political party? The other ones on the other side of the religious divide? They're the bad people over there? And just us, we're the good people over here? Isn't this just in-group, out-group? Isn't that what we've just set up? And, and so, well, it's the structure that's the problem. Well, absolutely, the structure is the problem. But didn't the didn't the problem in the people become the problem in the structure? And didn't the problem in the structure become the problem in the people? This just keeps going round and round and round. Where people, no no country where the communists actually came to power, where people like those in your family actually got to make the decisions. No, I, I think and, so, and somehow, <coughs> somehow, like may, maybe. Um, yeah, it, maybe there were indirect ways that it was helpful or beneficial in countries that did not become communist, but in countries that actually became communist, um, um, you know, uh, it, it didn't actually ever seem to work out for those people. I definitely think that there was some sense that uh, they were fooled and duped in this situation. But by this. Oh, OK. They're fooled and duped. Well, who are they fooled and duped by? Well, they're fooled and duped by the evil people. Where did the evil people come from? Do, do we have a separate farm or factory or, or segregated area of society where evil people come from? Well, that's a very dangerous question because then suddenly you're segmenting evil people from a racial group or an ethnic group or a political group or another group over there. Is that where evil people come from? Are evil people born that way or evil people educated that way? The same sense that uh, they were fooled and duped in this situation. But by the same token, not wanting to make this too ad hominem, mm-hmm. um, you know, as a gay man, I think that a lot of your rights would have been seen much earlier by the communists who were earlier to that party. I think that um, to an extent. 
Putin hasn't seemed to gotten gotten on board the ex KGB man. How well do these things work? Some of I think that um, to an extent, uh, some of the things that we just take for granted as part of living in a tolerant society were really not found outside. And so, if you were trying to dine a la carte. Um, maybe you could take something from the commie buffet, you could take something from the anti-communist buffet, um, and you could uh, steal a little from, you know, regular uh, party politics. Of course, the Dixiecrats were not exactly the most racially progressive group in the world. Things were very different, and there was no clear place to turn. But, but who's selecting from this buffet? And what makes you think the people selecting from the buffet will, in fact, select in a reasonable way? way, not only for themselves, but for others. If you go to a, a subsequent podcast that Eric did on his portal, he talked to a, he talked to a guy, it was a very interesting conversation. I, I didn't think to pull it in because I can only think of certain things when I put these things together. But, but he was talking to a guy who was basically saying that people do not make good decisions for themselves at all. Jordan Peterson makes that point in terms of uh, treat yourself as someone that you're supposed to be taken care of. We're, we're terrible decision makers because we can't see too far down the road. And in fact, what we usually do is we just kind of bumble along in life and we see an idea that looks good and we follow it half a day or two. And then we put on a T-shirt or grab a placard or vote a certain way. And we're, we're really pretty bad at all this stuff. Yeah, it's always it's always easy for us to judge people in the past too too harshly. So I think I think that's a that's a that's a good uh, generalization. Uh, I I would I would say that the uh, you know that there's something about the uh, the revolution the extreme revolutionary movements that always um, seem to be from my point of view the violence was always too much. Well, and I w- and and you know it's a it's a uh, it's a package it's a package deal, but. Uh, well, the extreme revolutionary movements, we call them revolutionary movements because they're violent. You know, every four or eight years when, when power changes hands at the top in the United States, we don't call that a revolution. It's a pretty significant thing that we do this without blood in the streets. And it's, a, it's an enormously significant thing. But I'll take your point. Uh, um, I, I don't like the violence part of the package. And that's, 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 the, that's the part that at the end of the day makes me think the package would not have been worth it. So what I would like to do is to take a quick break and I would like to come back on exactly this point because it's the point where I feel that perhaps you are least understood by the outside world with, in terms of what we've been talking about, both growth and progress on the one hand and violence on the other. Now, now actually, my favorite part of this interview, in fact, comes right after this break, but I'm not going to play that because... I've already been playing a little bit of, and and this is only part of the overall presentation that I that I want to make today. But but I think what Rene Girard does in this conversation is he exposes the extent that the Romantic dream has has taken lodge in the Enlightenment and in our projects, and and we base so much on well this imagined goodwill. But see, part of the the facile low resolution way of talking that people are good or people are evil and bad guys and good guys again i think this joker movie just deconstructs this there there are no innocent people save maybe one and again i won't talk about that too much there are no innocent people in that movie everyone is victim and victimizer at the same time now i haven't talked about rationality rules for a while but Rat Rules had a Google served up a video upper left hand corner on my feed today, and boy, Google the Google al- algorithm was right. When facts are not enough, climate change, and there's a there's a picture of little Greta, and there's a picture of Jordan Jordan B Peterson right on there, and I frankly loved that video. I thought that video was amazing, but I think it was amazing in the way that that i forget his name right now but um but mr rationality rules wouldn't imagine a victim should be because i think the video itself completely undermined his worldview and exposed it as being essentially bankrupt at this point by the very challenge that it is facing he pointed to another video which i watched which i also very much enjoyed why people don't believe in climate change and basically what both videos are asserting is that climate change is the perfect storm against which 
human psychology cannot win. And now what's interesting about both videos is they'd like to, in a sense, self-transcend, sort of like Brett Weinstein, away from his robotic programming and say, oh, I'm looking up here down below at humanity, and now I realize that, well, rationality isn't going to win the day. Because given our conceptions of how, about how human beings work, our conceptions about how propaganda is supposed to work, our conceptions about how we can use our political and our economic and our communications industries in order to move society to overcome the challenges that we face. The same way we did so through two world wars in the 20th century and then the Cold War. All of these ways that we can mobilize ourselves to win, this cannot work with climate change. In fact, it won't work. In fact, it's not working now. Four out of ten people are climate change skeptics. And the idea, well, if we just pour more media at them, if we just pour more education at them, if we just send them to university more, if we just give them more information, then all of their minds will turn. And then what? But if you watch the videos, what you realize is they're talking to young people who are going to a, a protest about climate change and asking them, do you eat meat? Yeah, I'm not giving up meat. Do you drive in a car? Yeah, I'm not giving up a car. Do you have a smartphone? Yeah, I want the best smartphone. In other words, we're wired to want what we want. And these larger, these larger threats, something like climate change, which is so diffuse and not immediate, well... It doesn't matter in many ways just how rational you are. You're probably not going to beat it. And to make matters worse, you're talking, again, as I said a little bit earlier in the video, you're talking the most educated, the most developed, the most prosperous places of the world. That's not where the battle really is at. The battle is in China and India and Africa and other parts of the developing world. Those are the places that the, the chart is going to go you know, it's going to go off the charts in terms of carbon emissions. You know, you can zero emissions in the developing world, and we're still in the same boat. So back to Eric Weinstein's question. How much violence are you willing to tolerate in order to save yourself? Isn't that the basic question of humanity? Isn't that we what we always want to know? Isn't this the question in the Garden of Gethsemane? when they come at Jesus with swords and Peter draws a sword and Jesus says, put it away and heals the ear of the servant of the high priest? Isn't this really the question of humanity? And what Rationality Rules says in his own title is, facts are not enough. Human beings are not rational. Now he exempts himself, he excludes himself. Well, he alone is rational. So then the question is, well, what will these rationalists who sit above on high, what will they impose on the masses and just how much violence can they tolerate in order to save the world? This is the same question that is asked at the beginning of every war. The Roman way was a way to save the world. The Persians believed they had the answer to, worlds, to world history. Sometimes the answers are very individual and egotistical. But the Nazis thought they were saving the world because of their ideas of racial evolution. The communists thought they were saving the world. Didn't Khrushchev tell, tell Kennedy, we will bury you? Because, well, this is, this is class struggle. We have the interpretive key to human history here, thanks to Karl Marx. And, and this is the way it goes. So, hey, you know, yeah, a lot of people are going to die when we tear apart the, the farmers in the Ukraine and Belarus. But, but we're, we're building the perfect society. And the proof is in the blood. Well, that's pretty much what the Aztecs thought, too. This doesn't change. Now... I had a conversation with, with Dr. Jim, the cardiologist, and I'm going to post it a little bit later. I think I'm probably going to post this one tomorrow, but I'm going to post this one a little bit later next week. And Dr. Jim pointed me to another philosopher and his observation that I thought, well, nicely illustrated what I'm talking about here. So I'm just going to pause this recording, and I'm going to insert it here. Yes, I'm going to do some editing. I'm going to insert it in here, and then I'll, and then I'll pick up on it. The, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. So, you know, this, this split vision kind of idea is, is kind of the, 
way I was kind of wanting to wander. And uh, to illustrate this, I was I, I would bring up a guy named uh, Wilford Sellers. Now, I, he's a philosopher from the middle of the 20th century. I don't recommend him really as someone to read because he comes from an analytic tradition. But he kind of undermined the whole analytic tradition by, by at, not attacking, but um, undermining the, the idea that science could be purely based on empiricism. And he did that from within the analytic tradition. So he kind of stopped, in, in a certain sense, you might think of him as a guy who stopped the analytic dominance of, of philosophy in the, in the American you know, uh, um, academia. And uh, there's, a, there's a quote that I would read for him that kind of goes parallel with this and maybe evokes in your, in your mind that first couple of sentences of Maps of Meaning with the field of objects versus arena for action. But he wrote a book called The Philosophy, Philosophy and the Scientific Image of Man, and I'm getting this from the, the Stanford Encyclopedia page. Um, philosophy and, and, and the... Um, Scientific image of man describes what Sellers sees as the major problem confronting philosophy today. This is the clash in quotes between the manifest image of man in the world and the scientific image. These two images are idealizations of distinct, distinct conceptual frameworks in terms of which humans conceive of the world and their place in it. Sellers characterizes the manifest image as quote, the framework in which excuse me, the framework in terms of which man, come, man came to be aware of himself as man in the world. But it is more broadly the frame, framework in terms of which we ordinarily observe and explain our world. The fundamental objects of the manifest image are persons and things with emphasis on persons, which put normativity and reason at the center stage. According to the manifest image, people think and they do things for reasons. And both of these can occur only within a framework of conceptually, excuse me, of conceptual thinking in terms of which they can be criticized, supported, refuted, in short, evaluated. So that's the first posture that he takes on the manifest image, but then he makes the following claim, which is kind of where I wanted to go here. As comparing that to the scientific image, which he doesn't describe more, which isn't described explicitly here, but it's, the, it's what we were just talking about. And so then the, the quote goes on, Sellers claims that the scientific image presents itself as a rival image. Hmm. From its point of view, the manifest image on which it rests is an inadequate but pragmatically useful likeness of, the, of reality, which of, the rea of a reality which it first finds, at, um, so let me try that again, useful likeness of a reality which first finds its adequate in principle likeness in the scientific image. In other words, the scientific image has within it a kind of impulse towards totalization, an impulse towards being all there is, the, the, the whole show, if you will. And, and I think that's in the description that I gave in terms of this unexceptionalness or this lack of exception. And I think that's kind of where it, I see kind of a problem or the problem arising, which is that, um, it, which is that we have a temptation to move towards Sam Harris, let's say. We have a temptation to move towards a sense that things in the manifest image are not quite as real as things in the scientific image. Or to put that another way, the two images entail a kind of ontology. So if we, if we see the ball behaving the way it is, coming along with that is the ontology that things are material, that things are bound up in this. We see on the other side the persons and their... And their ontol the ontology of that world, which is persons and agency and free will and, and all of that. But there's a kind of intuition that we have, and perhaps an intuition that this might have been inherited through modernism as, per as perhaps different from before, which is that we set up a hierarchy of being. There's a hierarchy of being rather than, rather than a kind of easy coincidence of things, as I described in, in playing soccer with Kevin. There, when we reflect on it, when we step back, 
what we do is we start to see things like, well, gosh, you know, free will doesn't seem to be consistent with the scientific image. And that means that I have to put the scientific image at some level of more substantial ontology. And now I'm demoting the manifest image and I'm seeing it as somehow less real. And I'm starting to wonder about terms like emergence to explain it. And now, and ultimately I arrive at Sam Harris where the self is an illusion. And I see that word illusion when he does that. I don't know if you know that spiel that he has where he, he says something like, you know, the, the, we know the biochemistry of the brain and we can see on the MRI that this stuff is happening and that stuff is happening and we can see in the anatomy that that stuff is there and that means that the self is an illusion. And that's that same move and illusion in that sentence functions as a deflationary term. It, 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 it relegates our, our direct experience of the world to a lesser status in terms of ontology. You cannot have an ontology that excludes things from existence. Non-existence is not a reality. It's just another category of existence. And, and therefore, it's, an, it's just a way of kind of, with superlatives and with emphasis, um, describing something as having less claim on reality rather than, I, I, I don't know if you followed all that, but oh, absolutely. I, think, I think the modernist turn in a way has this temptation to set that hierarchy that up that way and we inherit that and then we struggle with it because of that rather than, rather than being able to embrace the, you know, the, the, the alternative. Now, I love what Dr. Jim just laid out here, that there are these two images, there's these two visions, there's the manifest image and the scientific image, and, and that this manifest and the scientific image are, are competing, and they're rivals, and, and what happens is that the scientific image has, in some ways, amongst certain people, said, well, we're, we believe in the scientific image. This is the image at the top of the hierarchy, and we'll use Sam Harris to epitomize that. Jordan Peterson comes along and says, you don't act like that's the case. In fact, you can't get rid of the manifest image because in many ways, all of your moralities, they all live in the manifest image. They're not in the scientific image. Oh, we're going to make science, we're going to make morality scientific. Eh, we haven't managed to do so yet. Why? Well, for lots of reasons that I've talked about in many, many videos. That whole ethical world, when Eric Weinstein asks, just how much violence can you tolerate? He's asking that in the manifest image, not in the scientific image. When we ask in the scientific image, how many cows do we have to kill in order to produce how many hamburgers for McDonald's? Well, we can do that math. If you ask, how many cows should we kill? Well, that's over in the manifest image. So, so these are two wholly different images. Now, now what happens is that climate change, again, if you, I really recommend you watch Rationality Rules video and the other video that he points to. Climate change is the perfect storm to destroy this vision of rationality. You know, however many humans survive, whatever happens in this world, I don't know. But I'm telling you, what will not survive is modernistic rationalism. It will be dead because basically it will be shown to be a system that does not work and could not stand up to, well, this threat that all of these scientists and most of the news organizations and most of the elite people of the world say is going to kill us, but man, we, we don't really want to threaten China and India and all of these, some of these countries with nukes themselves with annihilation unless they somehow unless they somehow submit to our vision of carbon emissions and what is tolerable to ensure the future of the world, at least the regimes as we know it. You know, colonization, the, the Spanish overtook South America. Why? Well, there, well, there's always two competing reasons, and you see this right away at the founding of America. The, the, the Plymouth colony is founded by, by people looking for religious freedom, and, well, 
they they wanted religious freedom for themselves but the puritans weren't always real good at religious freedoms for the people within their community so hence we get these ideas of puritanism so on one hand puritans believing in well religious the freedom as a theory but also social compliance and down in virginia that colony gets going because of a drug that we call tobacco and, and so America is between these two poles. On one hand, a religious pole. On the other hand, a commercial economic pole that's built on a highly addictive substance called tobacco. And on we go with this. Well, so we're sort of between these two poles again and again in history. The Spanish conquer America and watch the movie The Mission. The movie has lots of political undertones, but on one hand, the movie says we should save the we should save these indigenous people and we should make them Christians. But okay, or should we enslave them and use them for our own commercial exploitation? All right. Well, there we are with this challenge right now. Um, do we enslave the developing world to keep their carbon emissions down, or do we, you know, the, the that doesn't feel good about ourselves in terms of our narratives. You can never arrive at a political solution for this. How much killing can you tolerate to, to impose your vision of the world? Will democracy be the casualty? Can we afford other people? Look at when Yuval Harari wrote his book Homo Sapiens. He did an interview which was, which was fascinating because the question will be, well, all of these, Andrew Yang, I haven't listened to Eric Weinstein's conversation with him yet, but Andrew Yang says we need UBI. This is what, what, what Eric Weinstein and Peter Thiel were talking about. Because what are we going to do with all the excess people? We'll define excess. Well, excess is sort of like weeds in a garden. Is it a plant? Yeah, but it's a plant that doesn't comply with my vision of what the garden should be. The difficulty, of course, you're going to face, which in a way the Joker movie begins to hint at, is that power has already been democratized. That's, in many ways, the threat that, that lies behind a lot of what Eric Weinstein is saying. In this age where individuals can have so much power, how can we, how can we put it back in the bottle? Power has been democratized. You can't kill the mob. This is, of course, what China is facing right now with Hong Kong and, and why well, you just better not let Tank Man get out and let the people see that one man stopped the tank because the power of your regime, and we've seen this again and again throughout history, the power of your totalitarian regime is only as strong as the soldiers' willingness to kill their brothers and sisters in the streets. So, wow. Wow. We've got a perfect storm here. And the movie The Joker comes along and exposes it all. All these ways that we imagine we're going to get out of our mix. The movie, the movie comes along and says, what if we can't? What if we are not really the, we're the good ones. We're the ones with clean hearts. We're the ones with clear minds. We're the ones who are going to sacrifice for the other. No, no, we're the ones who, when push comes to shove, are going to try and preserve our own at the expense of everyone else. What if that's true of us? What if our, what if this, what if this assassin robot programming that Eric Weinstein keeps pointing us through is really real? What then? Where does that leave us? Then who will be our king? We have no answers. I'm not a politician, the Joker says, a number of places in the movie. Everybody says, are you political? I'm not political. And in a way, he isn't, because being political would bring too much order. But this whole narrative, there's a reason Peter Thiel brings up René Girard here, because in many ways, I think the reason we're going to see René Girard continue to come up in conversation is Gerard sees this and Gerard is not is not cowed into presuming the warmth of human kindness of human beings when they're in a bad spot and he says we have over centuries developed means by which we control human violence, and that means is religion. Now again, as I've noted, in I did a conversation yesterday with Jeff, which that was a 
great fun for a conversation. I know a bunch of you in the comment section have already said, oh, that was hard to listen to. Well, yeah, but, you know, on one hand we say, oh, we're going to need hard conversations. Well, hard conversations are hard. And, and they take, you know, they take patience and restraint and in working through them and and so in some ways you know in terms of brett and eric i'm right there with them yeah we need hard conversations yeah we should presume the goodwill of the other side because we have no other choice but we have to do that on one hand and on the other hand also understand human nature what human nature is like now again in all the conversations that i've been doing there's there's this big push for we need a new religion well it's the return to religion of the secularists because then I think what we're seeing in the movie The Joker, and again, I think this is sort of an apocalyptic prophecy for our time that what the movie The Joker reveals to the horror of the audience, and this is not horror of, ooh, my my mere neurons have seen some blood spatter. There's, there's some blood spattering in the movie, but it's, ooh, my idols are exposed and I have no God. And what if, what if the evil isn't the one on the other side of the border wall and on the other side of the political divide or on the other side of the town in the neighborhood I don't dare, dare to go because of the color of my skin or the, or the quality of my car? What if the problem is within me? What do I do then? The question then isn't, what can save all these masses to agree with me so we can keep our democracy and still save the world from the environmental devastation that we believe is about to happen then suddenly the question is what do i need to save me from myself and i actually believe if you start asking that question you've now asked a quite a productive question